welcome to the stage, Black Hat founder, Jeff Moss. Ah, this is really impressive. Last year when we came out here, I was blown away. This year I'm a little ready for it. I'm ready for you this year. And uh, I want to welcome you all to Black Hat USA 2018, our largest event ever. Thank you so much for coming on out. Now, if you know me, and you know the conference, you know I kind of go through a little opening. And I like to call out the people who come to Black Hat uh, from different countries. Total number of countries this year, 112 countries are represented. That's a pretty, pretty big number. It's what about a little less than half in the world, about half in the world. 26 of the countries, though, have only a single uh, representative. And I don't know how we can find these people, but I'd just like to call it out. Thank you for attending. Everybody uh, from, uh, th everybody. <laughs> the one person um, <laughs> from Albania, uh, Angola, Azerbaijan, Bangladesh, Bermuda, British Virgin Islands, uh, Burundi, Ethiopia, French, Guyana, Greece, Greece, just one from Greece? I guess they have some money problems. Um, <laughs> we've got uh, <laughs> Guadalupe, uh, Honduras, Isle of Man, uh, Macau, Serbia, the Seychelles, Sri Lanka, Turkmenistan, Uruguay. It's pretty impressive. And also this year, we have a record number of scholarships that we award. So for those of you not familiar, uh, Black Hat, we're constantly trying to bring in a younger, uh, new uh, generation. People who can't afford the price, but they still probably deserve a seat uh, at the table. And so we have a scholarship program where people write white papers, they get reviewed, and we select the best ones. There's no fixed number if we get great ones, just keep accepting the scholarships. And this year, we had 233 scholarships awarded for free admission uh, for students. So if those scholarship uh, winners are here, uh, well, you didn't win, you earned it. If you're here, let's see you raise your hand. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Guys. Right on. Now, I'm just going to open with a couple of remarks, and then we're going to move on to the main event. Um, I'm just going to talk about, it really seems to me this year that um, it's like I, I feel like I'm being tested, or I feel like maybe the community or the industry is where we're like in a final exam stage. It's sort of like we've matured to a certain extent, but world events now have caught up with us, and we're being tested. Are we as good as we say we are? Um, and if you think about offense as being almost purely a technical endeavor, there's really, what are the politics involved in, in offense? It's like maybe target selection, how much money you spend, do you burn a zero day on the attack, that kind of a thing. But the politics are pretty, you know, small P, not capital P. But on defense, on defense, like Halvar would talk about in his previous Black Hat talk, uh, defense is political. It's largely political. Um, you know, how much money do you spend? Do you have a cross-departmental risk strategy? Do you, uh, you know, what kind of uh, corporate you know, gems are you trying to protect? You know, the golden eggs. Um, all of these things are sort of uh, political decisions. And if you think about it, I believe that uh, the technology we're developing favors offense, the machine learning, the reinforcing algorithms. Um, so I, I think... The momentum is on offense. Defense, you know, we're kind of stuck with politics. And that has some really interesting um, consequences in the way we think about things. So for example, when you guys do, raise your hands if you work in a company that has a culture of security, right? Who works in a company that has a culture of offense, right? Not too many. We have to build a whole culture around defense, offense. Not so much, right? So these are difficult problems. And if you look at like, what are the problems we're facing now? GDPR compliance. That's pretty political. You have to make some tough decisions. You can't just twiddle an ACL on your router and fix GDPR. Um, 
And soon we might have a California law to deal with. You know, you've got uh, third-party risks that are becoming more and more important as we move more and more to the cloud. You sign more and more third-party uh, partner agreements. That's a political decision, too. And if you look at the, some of the problems, say, uh, Facebook had with, um, with data retention, right? Cambridge Analytica gets their hands on some data. How do you claw that data back? Who has access to your data, and what are they doing with it? Right? Not really a technical thing. That sounds political. And I think in the last year or so, we found that business models are running smack into political models. Um, so for example, if your business model is to connect the world's users, but you're dealing with a government whose biz uh, business model um, is to control content for the stability of society, there's going to be some political conflict there, right? Your business model is not compatible with a political model. And we're starting to see that play out on a global scale. And that's ratcheting up the tension. And that seems new to me. I mean, it's always been a little bit, but this is new. And that's why I think we're really sort of in this final exam stage where all of these issues are sort of conflating. And they're going to look to us for answers. Right? That's, it's going to be people in this room that are involved in these conversations. Um, and I'm sorry I don't have the answers. I doubt you have the answers too. But I think together, we can probably figure this out. Um, it, it feels sort of like our adversaries have strategies, and we have tactics. And that's not very good. I don't like being in that situation. I don't like having no strategy. Um, sure, my server is locked down, and sure, I'm buying good products, but those are tactics. You know, what's my overall strategy? Um, and so I'm guessing that there's maybe 20 companies in the world um, who are in a position to actually do something about um, raising the level of security and resilience for all of us. So for example, if, you're, uh, if your strategy or your tactic is to buy good products, you're totally dependent on the product manufacturers. Um, I can't fix the problem in the Microsoft operating system. Only Microsoft can fix that problem. Right, so anything I can do politically or financially to incentivize Microsoft to create a better product, that will help everybody on the planet. Right? And to their credit, they've been making large improvements. Um, and we've seen how bad guys and criminals uh, respond. Uh, that's why I'm really curious to see how they'll uh, respond with uh, Adobe Flash being deprecated. I saw an article saying that we're going to get more spam because uh, the flash is going down, so the spam's coming back. It's so I think maybe there's 20 companies in the world in a position to influence us globally. They make operating systems, mobile operating systems, browsers. Um, and they are, their decisions impact hundreds of millions or billions of people. Uh, and I, I have a little short story. I was talking to the vice president of engineering at one of these companies. They make telecom equipment that everybody on the planet uses. And I was asking him, I said, hey, how come your defaults on your product are default insecure? And um, you don't do source address validation on all of your traffic. How many of your customers actually spoof traffic? Oh, I don't, I don't think anybody really spoofs traffic. But you allow spoof traffic by default. Well, yeah. It's like, well, why don't you change that and do the safe thing? Oh, yeah, you know, our customers never asked us for that. Like, but you are the security company, right? That's in your marketing, it's in your branding, and you wouldn't make a simple change. Um, and so I think it's up to us to put our pressure on these companies, ask for the features, and we can change the security posture of the, the entire world. Um, so one of these companies, one such company that we're all familiar with is Google. I mean, they have dominance in mobile, their browser, Chrome, sets the standard, I think, for uh, safe browsing, the uh, innovations they do there, uh, the way they approach problems in sandboxing. Um, and I mean, I think 80% of the people in my address book use Gmail. So anything Google does that is an improvement essentially impacts us all. Um, and so 
I think the in most interesting recent advance then for all of us that impacts all of us is the move of Chrome to deprecate HTTP in favor of HTTPS. The warnings are starting to pop out. The customers are starting to freak out. Um, and I think that's a really good thing. I don't know uh, the second order, third order effects of that. But at least, finally, after like 15 years, we're finally seeing some movement. And it's because Google decided to do this on their own, not because there was an industry push or a government. Um, that's the power of an individual mover in this area. So before we bring out Parissa Tabriz, Director of Engineering and of Project Zero, it is my pleasure to welcome back up on stage uh, the Koala CEO and Chairman, um, Philippe Courteau. And it's funny, I've been introducing Philippe for like almost 20 years. He's the longest time supporter and sponsor of Black Hat. Um, so I've kind of got, I've got him memorized. Um, but Philippe, if, you've, if you followed Qualys, um, remember SaaS, Software as a Service? Um, they were one of the first companies to move into SaaS when SaaS was the buzzword. Um, now we call it cloud. But it's essentially the same thing. They've big been, in a, uh, been a big innovator there. And, uh, and I just want to welcome Qu Philippe up to stage say uh, the introduction for our keynote, and then I'll see you back here on stage after uh, Paris is done. So with that said, thank you so much for coming, and have a great con. So see you. <laughs> Philippe, take it away. Thank, thank you very much. OK, so oh, great. So thanks, thanks uh, Jeff, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So it's. Uh, it's really great to see uh, how much uh, you know, Blackout has grown, and I, would, and I should say also grown well. So Jeff, you can be really proud of your baby. So I think today uh, we have entered into an era where technology uh, infused itself into our very lives. And this is an accelerated pace. It's almost difficult to predict uh, what kind of next big technology is going to be in our lives. So it's very clear that cybersecurity has become now a foundational, foundational technology. So the days are over where bolting security on you know, was what we were doing. I think today we have to build security in. And this is a unique opportunity. I think we have to put our hearts and mind you know, to do that. That means change. And this is why I'm really happy today to uh, welcome our keynote speaker, uh, which has worked very hard uh, with her team to make Chrome safe and to build security in to make security transparent. So with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really happy to welcome uh, our brother boss and princess of security, Patrice uh, Parisa. Fabrice, thank you very much. OK, very good. Go for it. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Does anyone recognize this game? Anyone? I see, I hear some laughs. So it's called Whack-A-Mole, and it was and is a popular arcade game in the United States and Japan. I played it a ton as a kid. And um, the concept is, if you're not familiar with it, that you, you get a mallet, and you have to mack, uh, whack little moles as they pop up from their hole before they actually retreat back in uh, to their hole. And the more moles you whack, the more points you get. As the game advances, the mole speed gets faster. Now I have two younger brothers, David and Michael, and recognizing the, the limits of my own response, I would recruit them to help me. And so I would have David on one side, responsible for one row of moles, and Michael on the other side, responsible for the other row of moles, and I would focus on the center. And you know, then we can get a lot of points and, and work much faster. Now, that's obviously against the spirit of the game, but I don't feel like I have to justify that to an entire auditorium of, of hackers. Um, now, I've worked in security now for over a decade uh, in a number of different roles. I've worked as a pen tester, as a security researcher, 
as an engineer, and then more recently as a manager. And I'll be honest, there have been times when I felt like I was living in a reality version of whack-a-mole. And, and not just because I'm mostly working alongside men. Um, <laughs> so it's incredibly frustrating when I see a report of a security vulnerability that I know was previously fixed or is some trivial variant of a bug we know about or a symptom of an underlying condition or process failing that we knew about but just haven't addressed. The world's dependence on safe, reliable technology is increasing. And as things get more and more interconnected, we have to stop playing whack-a-mole. We have to be more ambitious, more strategic, and more collaborative in our approach to defense. If there's anything I'm certain of, and if there's anything that I want all of you to take away from this talk today, it's this. Blockchain is not going to solve all of our security problems. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't done a, a walk around the vendor booth, and so there may, that may be in some marketing material, but don't be fooled. This room, and also everybody watching, represents the world's best experts on computer security. And computer security is increasingly becoming the security of the world. We know where many of the problems are, and we present them at Black Hat every year. And we should continue to look for those problems and share them with the world, but we have to do more to solve them. Jeff talked about this responsibility that we have to make things better. And I totally agree with that message. It is up to us. And to be clear, I'm, I'm optimistic. You know, we've actually made great strides in computer security over the past decade. There's more work to do, and the landscaping is increasingly complex, and our current approach is insufficient. So to be successful, we have to stop playing just whack-a-mole, and we have to do three things. First, we have to identify and tackle the root cause of the problems we uncover, and not just be satisfied with isolated fixes. Second, we have to be more intentional in how we pursue really long arc defensive projects. In particular, we have to identify milestones, work towards those milestones, and then celebrate progress along the way so we stay motivated. And finally, we have to invest in bold, proactive defensive projects. And, and that's a given, but we have to build a coalition of champions and supporters outside of just security so that those efforts are successful. My teams and I have been working on improving security amidst the complexity that all of us face. And I am so honored to be here and share some of that experience and some advice with everyone today. You know, I know that the resources that I have at Google put me in a really unique position. And, and I think that the responsibility I have is also unique. But we actually face many of the same problems. And so I do think the advice I have is generally applicable. You just have to solve your problems without free snacks. All right, let's jump in. So the first piece of advice is that I think we all need to do a better job of really understanding and tackling the root cause of bad security. We can't be satisfied with only isolated fixes. So one simple approach to doing root cause analysis, and this was taken from the car industry and Toyota, is the five whys approach. It's a technique where you explore cause and effect, and you just ask yourself why to really understand the underlying issues that cause something. And in asking those why questions, sometimes those form the next why question. So we'll do an example together. Let's say that someone discloses a remote code execution vulnerability in a product that you're responsible for. So you might ask yourself, all right, why did this bug, this single bug, lead to remote code execution? Or maybe you'll ask yourself, why didn't we discover this bug earlier? And that might lead you to say, why doesn't anyone write tests or fuzzers? Why did it take us so long to actually update our users? 
Why does it take five weeks to test a security fix? Now, some people criticize the five whys approach as being too simplistic, but I actually think it's a lot more than what a lot of tech companies are doing today. And it can highlight some of the structural and organizational root causes of bad security that have to change. I want to share one of the ways that we are trying to make change across the larger tech industry, software and hardware vendors, that the world and everyone in here relies on to invest more and differently in tackling the root causes of bad security. This is a picture of Project Zero, one of the security teams I manage. There's little fluffy Tavis Ormandy hacking away. Actually, I don't have a recent team picture for the whole team, but trust me that they're a similarly cute and curious crew. Project Zero is a team dedicated to reducing the harm caused by targeted attacks. More simply, they make zero day hard. And unlike other security teams at Google, they're not aligned to any specific Google product. They prioritize end user security above everything else. For the most part, Project Zero treats Google, Android, Chrome like any other third party vendor. Project Zero was formed in 2014. And over the past four years, they've reported over 1,400 vulnerabilities in a variety of different targets, operating systems, browsers, open source libraries, antivirus, password managers, firmware, hardware, and other popular software targets. Perhaps some of you have benefited from, from their incredible work. And, and that's an impressive number, but it's actually not representative of the most important impact from this team. Project Zero aims to advance the understanding of offensive security to inform and improve defensive strategies. They want to achieve the most defensive impact they can from any single discovery. In other words, do more than just one-off whack-a-mole fixes. Project Zero's strategy is to build a practical offensive security research pipeline to advance the broad understanding of exploitation amongst defenders. That ultimately leads to structural improvements and better end user security for the world. Now, one problem that the team recognized early on was that vendor response to fixing critical security issues varied hugely across the industry. And candidly, it often didn't tip in favor of end user security. Unfortunately, vendors don't always have incentives aligned to prioritize security. And you know, if we're honest, there's a pretty large power imbalance between individual security researcher and vendor, especially if that vendor is a large corporate entity. So to tackle that, the team notably introduced and still uses a consistent 90-day disclosure policy. This removed the historical negotiation between security researchers and vendors and it actually gives the public and all end users access to vulnerability information in a really consistent way. Now, since I manage both Project Zero as well as a large part of Chrome browser engineering, that puts me in a pretty unique position, especially when it comes to escalations. And initially, this deadline-driven approach was extremely controversial. It received lots of pushback. I've had some really engaging and, and uh, lively discussions with security leadership from different companies and, and within Google when it comes to this disclosure policy. And to be clear, there's absolutely no doubt that a deadline-driven approach caused short-term pain for large organizations that have to make structural change. And that includes pain within Google. But. Sticking to those deadlines over the years resulted in vendors rallying, innovating, and investing in making structural change, both technical and importantly organizational, that for whatever reason wasn't happening previously. Fast forward to today, and we see examples of vendors with improved vulnerability response and notification processes 
And a number of individual researchers and organizations have adopted a similar deadline-driven approach. We no longer see the same level of pushback. And we see vendors starting to invest in sandboxing, in reducing attack surface, and in really tackling common cl classes of security bugs. There's definitely more work to do, but I want to share some stats that are encouraging to me. And I'm going to withhold vendor names because I want to protect the innocent. But here are some examples of impact of note. One large vendor that a huge population of the world depends on doubled the number of security updates they release each year. Another different large vendor that's similarly well known and depended on improved their patch response time by as much as 40%. In total, the vast majority of security issues that are reported by Project Zero are now fixed within the 90-day disclosure period. That's up from 25% that the researchers experienced prior to deadline-driven disclosure. That's a huge, huge change. I don't know all the contributing factors that led to that kind of change inside vendors. And I suspect it was a mix of things. Addressing staffing needs or creating new teams, you know, investing in infrastructure to better test and release fixes, improving process. There could be a number of things. But regardless, we're seeing more security patches, faster response times, and users getting updated faster in software that the world relies on. And that is a net improvement to end user security. So aside from a lot of tight deadlines to instigate structural change, how else does all of this work apply to everyone here? Project Zero leveraged two tactics that I want to see more across our industry, transparency and collaboration, especially beyond corporate walls. First. Everyone that cares about end-user security needs to be more open, because it helps you and it helps all defenders. This is our external issue tracker. And when a Project Zero issue is fixed, or when the deadline hits, we de-restrict access so that anyone in the world can see all the technical details. This is a screenshot of our blog. Not a lot of marketing pizzazz. But what it lacks in polish it more than makes up for in raw research material that hasn't been censored by a gauntlet of corporate editors. Work in the open allowed Project Zero to do two things, share their ideas and really advance the common understanding of exploitation techniques, and two, grab and leverage the public's attention. You know, ultimately, the team recognized that an individual security researcher is not likely to change the behavior of a large vendor. Jeff touched on that. But public and customer response can. And that's what transparency offered. In addition to being more open, everyone that cares about end user security needs to collaborate more. That means we need to work together, outside of whoever paid for us to come here, towards shared security goals. And we've had some success here. So for example, people came together, both inside and outside the walls of Google, to analyze flash zero days discovered in the wild, to discuss and work on bug fixes, as well as to build exploit mitigations. Anecdotally, we've heard from security engineers at other organizations that they appreciate Project Zero attention, even if some of their executives don't, because it gets them more resources and support to work on the issues that they already knew about themselves. But there is so much more intentional collaboration that we can do together. You know, headlines imply otherwise sometimes, but I see a lot of shared values and mutual respect between researchers in Project Zero and teams working on security at other vendors. And we don't always agree on the specifics of strategy or tactics for optimal impact, but there's an understanding that we're generally working on similar goals. We have lunch together. You know, we meet up at Black Hat or other conferences. But I would love to see more ambitious collaboration. 
And that's going to require some hacking of our various bureaucracies and, and surely some lawyer wrangling and challenging of the status quo. But the effort is so worth it because what we can get from truly working together, I believe, is better defense. Based on some external data points that we see and also internal tests, the cost to build exploits across a number of high profile targets has increased. That's thanks to lots of people working together to tackle root causes of bad security. And I'm sure that many of you in the room have not gotten the recognition you deserve for this progress. And I'd actually like to give you some. And so if you identify as a defender, can you please stand? I know it's early, but consider this a morning yoga. If you identify as a defender, if you fix bugs, if you've written fuzzers, if you've developed mitigations in existing projects, if you've improved vulnerability response, if you've gotten your leadership to make fundamental change, please stand. Your work is the type of work that normally doesn't get headlines. And unfortunately, you're not going to win a pony award, sorry. But thank you for being an unsung hero for user security. Wait, 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 stay standing. And I want everyone to applaud these folks. I want us to celebrate and recognize defenders more. So that's it, right? Identify the root cause, make it open, collaborate. Bang, watch the world right itself. We all know that that's not how it works in practice. And making real change is hard. It results in pushback. You know, what happens when the timelines are long? Worse, what if the root cause is tangled in this bedrock technology that cross-cuts a heterogeneous tech and an organizational ecosystem? Project Zero, for all of its security sophistication, never had to directly tackle that problem. Root problems, even if they require less you know, sparks of ingenuity to discover, are sometimes harder to solve because we lose steam and we work in a distraction-driven environment. It requires strategy, both technical and project management skills, and let's be honest, a thick skin. You have to stay motivated to see the effort through over the long arc, and that can be years. Making fundamental change to the status quo is hard, but necessary. It absolutely leads to upsetting people. If you're not upsetting anyone, you're not changing the status quo. And this actually brings me to my next piece of advice, which is to make real change and to persevere while doing it, we need to pick practical milestones, we have to work toward those milestones, and very importantly, we have to celebrate along the way. So one project where I think we're succeeding in changing the status quo is shifting the world away from HTTP to HTTPS. Whenever I talk about HTTPS, I usually start with this prolonged intro about practical networking on the web, the risk of man-in-the-middle attackers, a list of current events that actually show that traffic interception and tampering happen all over the world. But given all of the talks and tools that have been shared at Black Hat over the years, I feel like I don't have to belabor that point to this audience, but I'll, I'll do it anyways. Without HTTPS, neither an end user nor a website can have any confidence in the security or privacy of data sent over the web. No HTTPS, no security, no privacy. In 2014, we started a more concerted effort to actually drive adoption of HTTPS on the web platform. So just to be very clear, I'm not talking about Google services here, but the whole World Wide Web. My team and I wanted to see a web platform that was secure by default, instead of a web that was opt-in secure. Also, we recognized at the time that Chrome's network connection indicators were actually really confusing to a lot of users. 
So this is what Chrome's connection indicators look like back in 2014. Which of these looks the most risky to you? Via a user research study, we discovered that users didn't actually perceive any risk with number two, which is the blank page icon for HTTP. And if we think about it, how would they? How would they perceive the lack of a, of a warning? But we all know that HTTP is certainly no better than an HTTPS connection with an error. And so given those icons are part of the core browser experience and something that users see all the time, we wanted to make the risk of unencrypted traffic more comprehensible and also more consistent. So we wanted to fix this. Now, we actually had a pretty clear vision of what the end state should look like. But we also knew that it would take many years to actually get there. The first reason is complexity of the web. So it's important to understand that the web is a platform that's not owned by any single entity or organization or company. The web is an open ecosystem of different players, each with different constraints and different incentives. You know, the web development platform is this collection of technologies defined by standards groups like W3C or IETF. And those groups, their membership is made up of individuals from all around the world. And then you have a bunch of independent browsers that implement those standards, as well as all of their own proprietary ideas and technologies. And today, web developers aren't building static documents like they were in the 90s. They're building these really rich, powerful applications that work on the web. These applications leverage third-party hosting providers, web frameworks, third-party libraries, and other services that result in this really complicated and heterogeneous tech stack. There's no HTTPS toggle for developers to turn on, and there are plenty of really practical hurdles and considerations when serving HTTPS. You know, if you're the developer, you have to think about migration complexity, certificate purchase and management, how is this going to impact my ad revenue? How is this going to impact my site performance? If it impacts my site performance, how is that going to impact my users? And then, of course, should I work on HTTPS support versus the dozens of other things that I have on my plate to do? Turning on HTTPS was too hard in 2014, and the business case wasn't made clear. So in addition to complexity on the web, the second reason that we knew this would take a long time was risk associated with making a significant change to a browser security warning. Now, if we made an isolated change to Chrome back in 2014, that would lead to users experiencing warning fatigue. It would also lead to confusion given different experiences in, in different browsers. You know, why does this one site look secure in one browser but not secure in another browser? It's not like there's a chat room where all the browser builders of the world come together and make a decision like this. So we learned from previous experience that to make a change like this, it had to be gradual and it had to be very intentional. Now, part of my job is to make sure that my team believes change is possible and stays optimistic over the long run. And when my team set out on this HTTPS journey, we set out to shift an entire ecosystem towards something more secure. This required strategically picking milestones, communicating them repeatedly to anyone and to everyone, and maintaining energy, celebrating progress all along the way, which is many years in this case. I'll share a really high timeline of Chrome's journey to evolve its UI to just show you what this looked like over the past four years. So we start with a naive bug filed by the Chrome security team to mark HTTP as not secure in 2013. And that quickly got shot down by a Chrome UI engineer who just said, this is too risky. It's unnecessary. The web has always been this way. Oh, you security people. You know. Oh, well, change don't come easy. So we got a lot of people that were passionate about this topic together. And we organized a brainstorming about how to drive HTTPS adoption. And we kicked it off with a TLS poetry slam as an icebreaker. So I made people get into groups with people they didn't know, and they had to write a haiku about TLS or SSL or encryption. And this was one of them from back in 2014. Um, we had a bongo drum. I made people snap. We brought the lights down. It was uncomfortable, but I loved it. 
Uh, and I think it, it got people, you know, hopefully having a little bit fun before we actually dove into work. I would love to hear your, your info sec haiku. Um, after that brainstorming, we drafted and published a more comprehensive strategy that we shared on Chrome's developer wiki. And that's open to the whole world. And we got feedback, probably from many of you and from other browser vendors. And we were able to leverage support and sentiment from the larger community to actually help convince Chrome leadership that this was an effort that was worth pursuing. And yeah, it would take many years, but we should do it. So thank you. We worked really closely with our awesome design team to evaluate the current network security indicators in Chrome and across all major browsers, because we wanted to improve this. And so we needed to evaluate what was needed today in modern, in modern browsers, and also think about accessibility needs and things that I don't think had been considered early on. This paper, Rethinking Connection Security Indicators, became incredibly important for us as we made this change, because everyone in the security community has an opinion about what they think the right security UI should look like. And this is really, really subtle. You know, security experts are rarely the best people to ask about mass usability. After publishing the paper, which motivated our changes, we made some laptop stickers with the icons that we plan to roll out. And that was just a fun, cheap way to celebrate with the team and also something for us to share with people outside of Google. And we eventually shared a more official milestone-based plan. And that started by showing not secure on HTTP pages that collected passwords and then increasingly ratcheting up the pressure over the years. We had a number of small projects over the last four years that I would just classify as, as quick wins. Um, we added a security panel to Chrome DevTools, and that makes it easier for web developers to actually migrate to HTTPS because we wanted to make that as easy as possible. We also published a living HTTPS transparency report, and that shed light on the top 100 sites of the web based on traffic and their HTTPS status. We had to navigate some corporate pushback because in publishing this report, you know, some of those top 100 sites were Google's partners, and people were a little bit concerned that we would make them look bad. And there was also some entertainment, adult entertainment sites in that top 100, and so some people didn't like that. But we pushed through it, we published it, and this report became a way for us to talk to the world about a shared problem that we saw and that we wanted to solve together with the world. Since 2014, we've also done a number of grassroots efforts to help developers on those top sites or in key verticals that we know are, are tipping points um, and help them navigate HTTPS hurdles. We learned about those and, and tried to help address those and also communicated those learnings really broadly. We also celebrated a lot of the transitions in public. The milestones, each one of them resulted in pushback and also the occasional hate mail. But they served a really important purpose. They were a reminder to the world that this was coming, and they give a very clear deadline for people to work towards. The quick win projects helped developers practically migrate to HTTPS and also brought some recognition to good actors. And that just helps incentivize other people to move. I covered some of the insight into our strategy, but results are, are what matter at the end of the day. And so this is a graph um, with data from our transparency report that shows HTTPS adoption based on traffic from Android, and then a Chrome on Android, and, and Chrome, OS, Chrome on Chrome OS. And you can see that on mobile, we've gone from about 45% on desktop in March of 2015, up to 87%. And also incredible progress on Android, from 29% back in March of 2015, up to 77%. This is for technology that's been around for a few decades. And so that's major, major progress. The web 
is ultimately more secure today because of a loose coalition of people working toward a common goal in a really complicated ecosystem. You know, I know the Chrome work best, but that progress is thanks to many, many other browser vendors and notably Mozilla, cloud hosting providers and certificate authorities that help to bring the cost down and make it easier to do certificate management. I want to shout out to Let's Encrypt for that because I think they've been pretty fundamental. Yeah. Um, a number of four and nonprofit organizations. So shout out to EFF, 18F, all the Fs, and dozens of privacy and security advocates around the world who I won't have the time to name, but thank you. I know that many of you in the room or watching from home have helped make this happen. Thank you. Kudos on the progress that we've seen. And that's really something to celebrate. So internally, we found fun ways to celebrate as well, and cheap ways. And practically, that just you know, helps keep morale up over the years. We ate a homemade HTTPS cake. And that was gifted to us by Alex Gaynor, who's now at Mozilla after we announced our public plans. We ate homemade HTTPS pie that was made by our technical lead, Emily Stark, after one of the phases. We had a team chat to share status and to vent frustration, and then just lots of celebrating you know, with the broader community on Twitter. Cake parties, poetry slams, stickers, those were fun for us. But they're also really important ways to keep morale up over the years. None of those ideas are cost prohibitive, and none of them are specific to Google. And so find your own ways to celebrate. Gluten-free, you don't have to have cake. I'm pretty sure that cake was a box cake, too. So again, not cost prohibitive, but important ways to celebrate progress as we really tackle gnarly security problems. Now, of course, you ultimately need some purpose behind the work. Rewards and parties aren't enough. And a lot of the people working on driving HTTPS were personally motivated by this because they had a personal connection to a targeted individual. Their ISP had interjected crap into their HTTP connection. Or they just really believe in the importance of secure transport on the web. I've seen how purpose drives people in this industry and really unifies. And I can think of few greater missions than keeping people safe as the world increasingly depends on technology. This brings me to my third piece of advice. And this is the importance of building a coalition of support when investing in ambitious and future-looking efforts. Now, in rolling out HTTPS to the web, the threats and solutions were actually relatively clear. Sometimes, often, we can't tell the exact form of potential threats to come. But we have to still invest proactively in defensive projects that promote core security principles. Isolation, containment, simplicity. Now, when the benefits aren't immediately clear, which is common in proactive defensive work, it's, import it's important to communicate upwards and outwards and get people outside of your immediate security team really invested in the success of the project. That's not just a generality. That's exactly what we did with Chrome's site isolation project. This is a high level of Chrome's architecture, how it launched 10 years ago. Chrome launched with a multi-process architecture and sandboxed renderer process. This would prevent a malicious site from taking over your whole computer. And that was a significant advancement for the time in browser architecture. It's an architecture that other browsers have adopted to, to varying degrees, and it offers a more secure, but also more stable and speedy experience. Now, at the time, 10 years ago, the largest threat from the web was that a malicious web page would compromise a renderer to install malware on your local machine. 
this architecture successfully brought that problem a bit more under control. But computer usage evolved. You know, we've seen the popularization of cloud compute and web services, and more and more data has moved online. Now, cross-site data theft can be as important a target as compromise of the local machine. Now, we didn't exactly know when the wave of attacks would come and when they would move from render compromise to install malware to when render compromise to steal cross-site data, but we knew that the incentives were there for a shift to be inevitable. With that realization, our security team started the site isolation effort back in 2012. This was an effort to re-architect the browser and mitigate this risk that we, we foresaw it in the future. Now, site isolation made it possible for Chrome to limit every renderer process to documents only from a single website. That means in the event of a renderer compromise, the wanted data just wouldn't actually be available. So that evolved Chrome's architecture from this to, it's really subtle, so watch, this. Looks pretty simple, but this turned out to be the largest arch architectural change and code refactor in the history of Chrome. Fast forward to June 2017, and Jan Horn of Project Zero noticed some oddities in how CPU caches interact with speculative execution. Now, Chrome already had a huge amount of the groundwork laid to help protect class, uh, users from a whole class of new bugs. No one would have predicted that something as big as Spectre would come along. But we did know where the assets were, and we've been attacking that root problem for a number of years. So Chrome actually had a huge head start due to the years of investment we'd been working on site isolation. We all need to continue investing in ambitious, proactive, defensive projects like site isolation. And so I want to review some of the ways a project like this can fail, because I want you to be able to predict and avoid those pitfalls as you pursue these proactive, defensive projects. So first, one way this could have failed would be management killing the project. And I include myself there. You know, the core site isolation team was a team of about 10 people over the years, plus or minus. That's a significant engineering investment that was dedicated to working on this project. It was something very forward-looking and not a threat from today versus you know, other things. And I think about those trade-offs. Originally, the, we thought the project would take one year. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, now, in practice, it's pretty hard to estimate a project timeline beyond a year, but we were off by a factor of six here. And estimation mistakes like that tend to put a bullseye on your project's back, and with really good reason, right? You can imagine that conversation with management. Like, what is it that you're actually doing here? Um, so in this case, the team was able to regularly articulate progress to me and also specific reasons for why it was taking so much longer, because there was so much more work than originally anticipated, as well as demonstrate positive impact in terms of overall Chrome code health. And that benefited lots of other parts of the Chrome project. And those benefits were clear to other people outside of security as well. In my experience, a lot of the most impactful security work in large projects is actually not adding new things and adding more complexity, but simplifying existing code or systems, since that inevitably leads to better security. Knowing that, I was happy to support this work over the years, and I could very clearly communicate that benefit and ongoing value to my boss and other people. Another factor that could have killed this project was lack of broader Chrome team support. So, as I mentioned, the site isolation team, about 10 people. Chrome is over 10 years old. That's old for a browser. Over 10 million lines of code, C++. Hundreds of engineers all over the world were a very distributed project. 
committing dozens of changes every single day. And site isolation was a cross-cutting change in the architecture. It's hard for me to convey how complicated this is if you're actually not working on Chrome, but I want to try by describing what a simple feature like find and page, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with via Control F, looks like. Now, originally, Control F was just basically a for loop over a document. After site isolation, iframes from different sites would have to be drawn in different processes. And so your simple for loop now has to ask every process to do a chunk of work, collate the results, handle cancellation or no response. And that for loop just became a distributed systems problem with cancellation and eventual consistency. And as a site isolation team, they had to do that for Control F, Control Z, printing, accessibility, compositing, and a bunch of other features. And now imagine that you're this 10-person team, and you have to find the owner for those features, and you have to convince them to stop working on what they're working on, but take your simple for loop and make it into something really, really complicated. In such an environment, if other Chrome team members weren't motivated to help, if they didn't respond to questions, if they didn't do code reviews, this project would have dragged on to forever. Now, the core site isolation team needed allies within the greater project. And they did a really good job of building that by explaining the value of project in ways that other people could understand, by maintaining a positive attitude, by being responsive when others asked them for help, even if it, didn't have, if it didn't have anything to do with security. And, you know, in general, just being a good citizen. So be a good team player. You know, don't be a jerk. It's just really good life advice. <sighs> Without getting into too many details, Site isolation threads a needle between many parts of the ever-evolving web specification that actually makes it possible to provide new security guarantees without breaking all of the existing web and sites. And so since this was a multi-year effort, it was totally possible in that time for the web and the standards to diverge in a way where site isolation wouldn't have been possible. And so similar to what we discussed with Project Zero and with rolling out HTTPS, the team prioritized transparency. And that makes it possible to work with a larger community. They really went out of their way to work with various web standards groups and to talk about this change so that they were also motivated to support the effort, or at least to avoid breaking changes. Now, in all three of the situations that I just mentioned, management, peer support, divergence in the larger ecosystem. The insight for the core work was stemmed from that 10-person Chrome site isolation team, but the ability to kill progress came from outside of the team. And so to make a project like this work at scale, you have to build a coalition of experts in many different roles and champions for your project. Our community may be able to find the right problems, and technical solutions, but we rely on everyone working in technology to clear the path to a safer future. All right, my time atop the moon is coming to an end, uh, and we have another really exciting black hat in store. I have no doubt we'll hear about new problems to respond to, but we have to invest more and differently in solving them. I want us to band together, both inside and outside of our organizations, to tackle root causes and to stop playing whack-a-mole. I want us to acknowledge that the environment we work in is complicated and really interconnected. And so we have to strategically pick milestones. And even then, as we work towards them, it's going to take a lot of time and hard work. So let's remember to reflect on the progress that we've made and actually celebrate progress. And as we proactively invest in ambitious, defensive, proactive projects, when the benefits aren't immediately clear, we have to build out our coalition of champions and supporters beyond just security experts. As I said at the start, I'm optimistic. I actually believe that security is getting better. 
And we should be really proud of the progress that we've made over the past decade. I'm also optimistic that we can continue to keep people safe as technology advances. And I only remain hopeful because I know that many of you working in this space, while sometimes cynical, or kind of often cynical, do so because you personally care about making positive change. It's up to us. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Do you need this? No. No, no, I'm good. All right, thank you, everybody. I've got just a couple of house cleaning notes, and then you're free to go. Uh, class is out then. So briefings will start in about half an hour at 10.30. The configuration is a little different this year. As you exit the hall, we're now using a downstairs area. We're referring to that as the North Hall. And then the other two floors are the South Hall that we used last year. So the only change this year is there's a downstairs area instead of an upstairs area. And on the second floor is the business hall. And that's where the reception is tonight at 5.30. So I'll see you there. Thank you, everybody. Have a good show. Thank <laughs> you.